The big question is, why are Jews more prosperous than the average person? Our next guest has 10 reasons in his book, Thou Shall Prosper, and he was kind enough to share two of those reasons with us on air. We also discussed his close friendship with a very popular radio host and personal finance specialist, Dave Ramsey, and the secret to Dave's methods and success. We chatted about money, happiness, and so much more. I love his accent and could probably listen to his insights for hours on end. Enjoy this week's episode. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. Welcome to another episode of Kosher Money. Rabbi Daniel Lappin graces us with his presence. And I came to find you through Zevi Wallman, but I knew who you were because of a viral clip from Dave Ramsey, where Dave Ramsey says he has an Orthodox Jewish friend who has written a book in which he discusses Orthodox Jews or Jews and their ability to prosper beyond the the norms. Dave Ramsey does an excellent job teeing up the question. Let's play that clip for everyone, and then we'll work our way towards some of the answers from Rabbi Lapin in the episode. Over the years, I've read a lot about it and thought a lot about it, and I, I actually had read a book that... Uh, changed my life. I love the book. It's one of my top 10 favorite books I've ever read. It's written by an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. My friend, and he's become a good friend of mine, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. And he became a good friend of mine because, um, you know, I mentioned his book on the radio show and it started selling. And um, <laughs> then he called me and he said, who are you? I love you. And um, so we became buddies, but he's, he's a great, he's a, his intellect is incredible. The book is called Thou Shall Prosper, and it is, the thesis of the book is the ten reasons that Jewish people have had a tendency to prosper beyond the population in every setting that they've ever been in throughout history. And today in America, 3% of the population is Jewish, and 67% of the Forbes 400 is. Yeah, you want to read the book now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things, there's ten things in here, and one of the things is generosity. That it's just part of the rhythm, culturally, religiously, with the folks in the Jewish community, is part of the rhythm of their lives is generosity. And it comes from this, and I love this picture, generosity. It's one of my favorite. As the Sabbath ebbs away each Saturday night, Jewish families prepare for the productive work week ahead by singing the joyful Havdalah service. The Havdalah service is recited over a cup of wine that runs into the saucer beneath. This overflowing cup symbolizes the intention to produce during the week ahead, not only sufficient to fill one's own cup, take care of your own household, but also an excess that will allow overflow for the benefit of others. In other words, I'm obliged to first fill my cup to take care of mine, but then continue earning or pouring, as it were, so that I have sufficient to give away to others. So the principle is, if the cup represents what we spend on ourselves, the principle is your, your lifestyle should always be less than your income. So I don't care how big your cup is. You can have a gloriously wonderful lifestyle as long as it's smaller than your income so that there's overflow to be used for the good of others. A, let's start with, how did you meet Dave Ramsey, what, what, what's that like? Um, well, I was just minding my own business. And because, um, <clears throat> you know, my paths are the paths of righteousness and my ways are the ways of peace. I Sorry. never look for trouble. I, I avoid provocative statements. And as far as possible, I avoid <laughs> controversy. And so uh, I wrote a book uh, called Thou Shall Prosper. And it, it became a, a long-lasting bestseller. It still actually continues to... Uh, uh, put my grandkids through college, and um, it's uh, it, it, it's a book that basically asks and answers a question which I get asked by my non-Jewish audiences all the time, and that is why are Jews disproportionately good with money? Now they feel very awkward asking it because they're worried I'm going to accuse them of anti-Semitism, but uh, I explain to them that. We're delighted to hear that question. We're happy you noticed. 
And uh, it's interestingly enough, only Jewish audiences. Uh, when I raise this with Jewish audiences, everybody sort of lowers down and slinks under the table, you know, hoping nobody... Hey, you know, they, they say, stop talking about it. I even actually got a complaint from the Anti-Defamation League of Nei Brith uh, 15 years ago uh, that I talk about Jewish wealth. I, Hello, guys, do you think nobody's noticed? <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you think you're living? Um, that's not to say we don't have such a thing as poor Jews. We don't have Jews who are struggling. Heaven knows that's a reality. Mm -hmm. But um, we, uh, we certainly have a disproportionately high number of Jews who are good with money. There's no question about that. And um, a, a statistic I quote regularly is that in the United States of America, uh, we Jews in total, that's self-proclaimed Jews, which includes a whole lot of people whose, whose actual Jewish identity is presumed rather than at any rate, uh, one and a half percent of the population. Now, I've been following the Forbes 400 issue, an issue that Forbes magazine issues every year, and I've been following it for decades already. Um, if everything was proportional, then one and a half percent of the population means we should be about six members of the Forbes 400. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually never less than 60. 60, not 60 percent, but 60, 60 out of the individuals out of the four, instead of six, so it's 10 times overrepresentation. Most years were closer to 100, which is a huge overrepresentation. 25 percent on some years. Of yeah. The Forbes now, in all fairness, let's also say that on the other side of things, we're rather underrepresented in the NBA. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon, right? No, it isn't going to change anytime soon. And the great black economist uh, Thomas Sowell. Um, There'd be a, a wonderful interview, by the way. Uh, and in a, in a normal sane world, I wouldn't have said black. I would have just said the great economist, because Thomas Sowell is an American treasure. But I mentioned black in today's culture just because the way things are. Sure. But uh, but he points out this this very fact in a, in a completely matter of fact and unbigoted kind of way. You know, he just says that um, you know some people are uh, better equipped in in some areas than in other areas, and uh, when it comes to uh, NBA. You know, we just don't do conspicuously well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not doing that good in the NFL either. But in the uh, in understanding how money works, we actually do extraordinarily well, disproportionately well. Do we have poor Jews? Obviously, but disproportionately well. And so the book uh, set out to uh, first of all debunk uh, four uh, foolish explanations. You know, such as the Cossacks killed all the poor Jews and left the rich ones re mm -hmm. able to reproduce, and which means there's somehow some kind of uh, money gene within Jewish reproductive mechanisms. Mm -hmm. It's all nonsensical. But anyway, after debunking it, the book uh, was the 10 explanations and the 10 keys that Jews have employed, consciously or subconsciously, because many of the Jews who are conspicuously successful financially now and in other times and in this country and in other countries are very, excuse me, very far removed from anything Jewish. But uh, there is such thing as the fumes in the gas tank. Mm. And it does continue. It doesn't continue forever, but it is there. And so um, uh, I, I analyzed these 10 techniques that we Jews use, successful Jews use, I should say, consciously or subconsciously, and I presented them in a way that said, regardless of your background, you don't have to be circumcised, you don't have to eat uh, lox and bagels. Uh, these are specific, 10 specific things that we tend to do, which work really, really well. Anyway, the book is, is out there and uh, doing well and getting around, and, uh, and I, I'm in my study one day, and uh, um, a young woman who'd been attending one of my shurim uh, called me up. Rabbi, Rabbi, do you know Dave Ramsey's talking about you on, on the radio? She says, turn on, turn on. Well, uh, at that time, I had my own radio show on, uh, on, on that same station, so I was very familiar with the station, but I wasn't aware with the full lineup. And so I flipped on, and, and I hear him talking, and you know, he says, this is one of the finest books I've ever read. I rec recommend it to everybody. If you really want to understand how money works, you need to read. And this is Rabbi Daniel Lappin. He's an Orthodox rabbi. 
Anyway, he hadn't even finished talking before I took out one of my personalized cards and I wrote him a very nice thank you card because I'm a big believer in not using email for meaningful communication. Wow. So um, I write him uh, a note and uh, a few days later, this was in the days when mail actually used to get where you were sending it in within a few days, and um, uh, the phone rang, you know, and, and this is this is Dave. Um, could I bring you to uh, to to Nashville to come on to come on my show? I said absolutely. You 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 did me a very big chesed. Chesed. What's a chesed? I said, well, it's a, it's a word we use that uh, has very significant meaning. Um, you actually you 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 boosted the sales of my book uh, very very dramatically. He how said, many oh. how many books were you selling before versus after? Um, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that was your first piece of communication with him, and, and then- so I, I went to uh, to Nashville, and and we had great fun doing a show. Then you know, let's can we carry on? Let's let's put another few shows on tape, and we'll we'll so yeah, we recorded for a few hours, but it was really just a wonderful conversation, if I may say, a lot like our conversation we're having here and now, very real, and um, and I discovered that um, uh, this is a man who believes implicitly that Torah was given by a college Baruch to Moshe Rabbeinu and Har Sinai. It's not a question. It's not debatable. That's the starting point. And, um, and he's, he's, a, he's a believing Christian, and he's got enormous respect for, for Torah and for, for Judaism per se. So we became, we became friends. And uh, from then onwards, uh, when he did, even, he used to do some, he still does, uh, other than COVID, some marvelous events in different parts of the country, uh, in Mexico, in Cancun, on the other coast. And uh, I would be a featured speaker there. Yeah. And, um, and it was really interesting because, I mean, the, not only wasn't there a minion within miles, there, there was very seldom not a, another Jew on the program. But, uh, but there it was. So, uh. Do you see a Dave Ramsey bump if you're not following him super closely and then all of a sudden you see an influx? You're like, oh, that must be um, the Dave So now jump. there are a lot of other things that could do it because uh, I, I, I do a lot of TV shows with, okay. different, uh, with, with different people. And, um, and so I, I, I might see a bump. I'm not a fanatical Amazon rankings observer. Okay. But um, uh, but I I get inconsolably miserable if we drop below thirty thousand. Thirty thousand so per. Thirty thousand from the top, oh, know, from out the top. of a whole several millions of the of the of the, uh, of oh, the gotcha. rankings. So what are the reasons? Let's go through a couple of the reasons um, of why Jews have been more prosperous than the average person throughout time, and we mentioned Torah is. Our study of Torah, one of the reasons as to why we are perhaps a little bit more strategic in how we go about things, is that an advantage um, as one of the reasons? Um, partially yes, and partially no. And, and here's the one big question that under no circumstances should you even think of asking me, which is why is it that somehow or another, those sections, the demographics of our community that are most faithful to Torah are very often those that struggle most seriously. Financially. Financially. Wow. Right. Right, right, right. right. So we, we, you, you absolutely should under no circumstances even think of asking me that question. I, but, but I'm going to ask it because if they were to put their brain, they're not striving for financial success, meaning if they were to reallocate their focus away from their intense studies and put it towards Wall Street, who's to say that they wouldn't be more successful I doubt financially? They would. You doubt they would? I doubt they would. Um, there's a long-standing myth that when I was in Shiva, I heard it, and after, it, it's... You hear it, and today a lot of people still hear it, which is, you know what, when you've done spent six, seven years developing your Gomorrah Corp, right. you'll be an asset to any company. And that simply isn't true. There's plenty of smart people in this world. Uh-huh. And so if you're talking about nothing but analytical ability, um, 
I'm sorry, but uh, do a statistics course and a finance course and an accounting course at your local community college, you'll be in far greater demand than if you've got six years in yeshiva. I'm Understood. sorry. It's, it's sad, but it's, it's true. So, so it's not just that, but you know, what, what is it? Well, there, as I say, I've, I've reduced it to 10 fundamental uh, principles, but let me give you an example of one. Um, it's an interesting thing, but uh, in 1953, uh, Edmund Hillary was the first man to climb Mount Everest with uh, Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. Now, I'm not saying I could do it. You may be able to, but a lot of people climb Everest every summer, so much so that there is a littering problem. There's snicker bar wrappers up and down the mountain. There's a lot of people doing it. Why didn't anybody do it before May 1953? They didn't think it was possible. Yes, exactly. Nobody believed it could be done. In fact, doctors said it couldn't be done. As soon as Edmund Hillary proved it could be done, then a lot of people do it. The same thing is true of the four-minute mile. It was one year later. Roger Bannister does a four-minute mile. All the doctors said a four-minute mile will kill an athlete. It's not doable. Roger Bannister, you'll see it on old pathy newsreels. Roger Bannister breaks the tape at 3.59, drops to the, 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 uh, the, the grass panting, and the newsreels say, well, he died doing what he loved. Yeah, he didn't die. He actually jumped up and ran a victory mm-hmm. lap. But now every college athlete does a four-minute mile. What's changed? Mm-hmm. Only what you just said. They didn't believe it could be done. Um, it's hugely important. I mean, coaches are not necessarily the best football players, right? A football coach isn't necessarily somebody who can put the ball between the uprights, but he sure knows how to get people to do it. And part of that is is psyching. Part of that is getting them to believe it. So um, deeply embedded within the culture is the idea that making money is fundamentally evil. And, and the way you see that is, uh, you know, terms like he's filthy rich. Actually, it's a lot filthier to be poor, I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, or they say, um, isn't somebody gives something charitable? And all the commenters say, oh, it's wonderful to see him giving back to society. Okay. What does that phrase mean he was doing to society while he was making the money in the first place? Mm-hmm. Obviously, ripping him off. Mm-hmm. Um, who is who commits most violent murders on primetime TV and on on uh, on gangster or, or, or movies? Not the people who actually commit violent crime in America. It's all businessmen, white business professionals, commit all the crimes. And when one speaks, as I have done, to some of the Hollywood producers involved in this rubbish, uh, they say, "Yeah, because they're the only group that has no defense league." Anyone else will be on us if we make them the bad guys. And so there's this whole culture that making money is, is, is really, really bad. And the bottom line is that nobody can ever succeed, genuinely succeed, at anything that deep in his heart he considers to be morally reprehensible. Mm-hmm. And so with us, there's, there, there are a lot of fundamental principles. I mean, uh, there, there are Rambans, there are Chazals all over the place. That, that uh, There's an Atsiv on this that specify. But one can even just look at Psukim, which is very, very beautiful. Um, HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts Adam Arishan in the Garden of Eden. And I'll just stick to English for the moment, to work it. And we're also told in uh, the Aseris Adibros, um, in the Sedra of Yitro, we're told, Sheshet um, Yamim Ta'avod. So you've got to work, and Adam Arishan was put in the garden mean to work, so that, that's all consistent. Uh, then we've got at the beginning of Perik Tess in Shmos, um, Hashem says, Say to Paro, you should let, me, let my people go, via Avduni. They will worship me. Look at any English translation. They will worship me in the desert. Hmm. Or um, at the end of Sefer Yoshua, there's a lovely Pasuk Yoshua. Uh, Yoshua is getting a little bit annoyed with everybody. And he says, listen, I've had it up to here. You people can do what you like. As for me and my family, we will not avoid it, Hashem. We're going to worship Hashem. Now, if you look at the King James translation of the Bible and, and many, many, many other translations of the Chumash on which, <coughs> excuse me, based on original English translations, uh, the first two examples I gave you say work. I can put God in, uh, Adam Arishan and God me to work it. Six days you must do all your work. Uh, and then the other two 
examples are all translated worship. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, uh, they, let my people go so that they may worship in the desert. As for me and my family, we'll, what nobody outside, people who, who don't have access to Torah, have no idea that it's all the same word, Oved, Ayin Bet Dalet, same thing. And as Samson and Rachel Hirsch and many others point out, when one word seems to have two meanings, then those two meanings, in order to fully grasp everything, you have to meld them into a kind of um, similarity. Same as uh, the Maharal talks about the word olam, right? Le olam va'ed means uh, forever and ever, eternal time. And adon olam means master of the universe. So infinite space and infinite time are both reflected by the one word olam. Now, not everybody in the 1600s got this. The Maharal did, but not everyone got this. It took until early 20th century uh, modern physics for space and time, as the, the Polish mathematician Minkowski and later Einstein, space and time meld into one reality. But the word olam already told us that. And so when, uh, when the Maharal writes, uh, ki hazman v'amakom inyan echad heim, time and space are the same thing. Kashe yadu ala mevinim, as we are. Smart people know, mm -hmm. you know, designed to make us feel horribly inadequate. And, uh, and so similarly, the word Oved means both. Why? What's the, what's the significance? Doing my daily work, working in the Garden of Eden, uh, six days I've got to take care of my work, but that's the same as Oved Hashem. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means that when we take care of Hashem's other children, our Father in Heaven, loves that and so I, it may even be why in English they use the word customer service and worship service have you been to service this morning already I've been to the minion but I think that's part of the concept because clearly our Kodesh Baruch Hu smiles when we take care of other people I am getting paid for it it doesn't matter you don't diminish it by being paid for it the fact is the work you're doing is for other people. It's, it's a huge concept. And so the way I go to work on a Monday morning is quite actually Sunday morning because I believe in six days mm -hmm. shall thou work. Um, it's quite different from the way other people, somebody with no awareness of this, trudges wearily off to work on Monday morning. I dance to work on Sunday morning because it's just another way of serving Hashem. I may be taking care of my customers. I've got a lot of clients I take care of. But that is it. That's one way of taking Hashem seriously. And uh, so obviously, when you, when, you, in, in, when you have this kind of approach, you're at a huge advantage. So what are some of the other reasons as to why, you know, when, when we talk about statistics and that Forbes 400 stat, yeah. people, people want to know. And, and I saw in Dave Ramsey's audience, which was not comprised of Jews, <laughs> no, they, their right. eyes lit up when they heard about this Forbes statistic. And, they, and he says, oh, you want to know, you, you, you want to know the secrets now, don't you? Yes, and they were like, right. yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure that's why they bought the book as the answers to all of their problems and the keys no, to the success. No, abso absolutely. Uh, yeah. The Gemara, it's a Gemara in, uh, in the Dorim, Daf Lamed Chet, um, speaks about a Kodesh Baruch Hu, Eino Mashre Shechinato, Ela B'mishu Hu Gibor, Chacham Ashir, V'anav. A Kodesh Baruch Hu Shechina only rests on people who are self-disciplined, wise, rich, and humble. Um, anybody who has suffered through the, the agony of financial stress knows how true it is, how hard it is to develop true kavana and to really build on a kesher with the Ribbon Shalom if you're worrying about how to pay the bills or you can't stand the look of stress on your wife's face. And so it's a hugely important thing. Um, increasing revenues is hugely important. And, um, and you asked about another, another one of the 10. Uh, thing. I mean, pretty soon we're going to come up to the point where I'm going to say, look, you know, we just got to get by the book. You know, yeah, we can't right. do this on the cheap. And we're going to put it in the show notes so that uh, <laughs> people you. can purchase it. Um, 
but no, I'm, I'm happy to happy to talk about it, and I I, um, I enjoy this opportunity. And thank you for inviting me. By sure. the way, I didn't thank you. This is um, this is real fun. Um, so here is uh, here is another one that that might be interesting. We understand a world of Gashmius and a world of Ruchnius. Now, Gashmius, I don't treat in a derogatory sense. Oh, that evil Gashmius. No, not at all. Uh, Gashmius is how Kodesh Baruch Hu created us, and, um, and it's, it's what we're here to refine and develop. And, uh, and, and then we've got a Ruchnius as well. What, what does this really mean? So in, in practical, meaningful terms, uh, one is the world of the spirit, the soul, um, and and the other is uh, the world of the body, the world of the material. And the best way to distinguish them is to realize that the former um, may not be measured in any laboratory. The latter measures easily. So, for instance, I can weigh my saxophone or I can measure its length or I can find out that it's made of brass, but there's no way to measure a tune. So if I write a tune, which I'm hopelessly inept at, but if I weren't, uh, I write a tune and, um, and I put it through a machine to find out if it'll sell. There is no such thing. Will this tune make people happy or sad? Is this a tune that'll make men willing to march off to war? Is it, is it a romantic tune? There's no machine that can tell that. It's a totally spiritual sensation. And that's why uh, the, the Hasidim tend to understand this better than I do. Um, that, that music is a profoundly and powerful spiritual. The Vilna Gorn, interestingly enough, no chosid at the time, but certainly understood this as well. Um, uh, when I met with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, we spent quite a bit of time discussing exactly uh, the connection between contemporary um, orchestral music and the music the Levim used to play in the Beis Amiga. So th- that's spiritual. Now, what we've got to understand is whether... Um, money is physical or spiritual and the first presumption is and and by the way i i i have to drop in this little thing and 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 i i i don't know what you what you'll think of it but we tend to pick up uh, things and this is something has been pointed out we pick up things from the societies in which we find ourselves in gollus so um, when Sa- uh, Samson Rafel Hirsch's shul in Frankfurt, Freiburg Anlage Gemeinde, after world before the World War II and after World War II, split up and set up outposts in Washington Heights and in London and in Johannesburg, um, what what you find is that they all retained the Pinklichkeit, the precision, the timeliness of of Germans. Right, those are the people who built BMWs and Mercedes. You don't do that if you're sloppy. Mm-hmm. And so yekkers tend to be pinklish. They tend to be precise on time. In the uh, yekker shul I used to attend, they took pride in timing Adon Olam, the whole morning tefillah. So Shabbos morning, as the last, last notes of Adon Olam die away, the, light, the clock turns the lights off and everybody's happy we did the timing right mm-hmm. this time. So uh, so, so we do, we do tend to... To, to acquire uh, some of these um, uh, qualities. And, and living in Europe, the part of us that after the Khurban migrated to Europe um, developed um, certain influence from Christianity, I'm sorry to say. One of the influences in Christianity, and, and I, I'm familiar with it because I speak for Christian audiences quite often, is um, tremendous discomfort with money. Money is nothing to do with God. It's material. Uh, poverty equals virtue. That's a devastatingly destructive equation. Mm-hmm. And to a slight extent, we're susceptible to it also. That my poverty is testament to my tzidkus, because I don't care about money. Interestingly enough, the Sfardim didn't grow up, didn't evolve, absorb none of this because where they lived, that wasn't part of the culture. And so Sfarim have this to a much lesser extent. They're very comfortable with being in business and, and doing, and also in general, Hasidim more than the Yeshiva Shoyalim also are very comfortable with this area. So th- these are really important things. And um, a lot of it flows from this principle of whether um, you, maybe you, you said you'd interrupt me if I talk too much. You're doing great. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, 
the I mean I'm I'm passionate about this stuff. I, I Clearly this so. Stuff. <laughs> and why? Um, so um, so the question is whether money is spiritual or physical. It's a hugely important question. And because of our influence from other people, I think we've absorbed a little bit of this idea that, that money is, uh, is, is worthless. And, and to show any interest in it is also a betrayal of, of every Torah value we hold dear. This brings us to the question that you absolutely should not ask me about it. So what is money? Is it spiritual or physical? Is it really nothing but strips of colored paper in my wallet? Or is it round metallic discs that clink in my pocket? Or um, uh, is it the orientation of iron oxide molecules on that magnetic strip behind my credit card? Uh, or is it ones and zeros on my bank's uh, hard drive? What, what is money? Or how about if I write you a check, here's $10, have, is that money? Well. You took the check, so it must be. Mm -hmm. How about if I don't write anything? I shake hands and say, I'll give you $10 next Friday. So what is it? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that money, obviously, when you work your way through, you come to, it's got to be spiritual. Now, this is hugely important because here's the problem. If you conclude that money is physical, and in an environment such as we live right now at, a time, at the time we are recording this and the place we are recording this, um, we're, we're at a time where understanding of spirituality has been all but banished from public education. And so most people grow up assuming that anything you cannot touch or eat or weigh or measure in a lab simply doesn't exist. Therefore, they conclude that money is physical. Now, here is a basic principle, ba physics 101. Any physical, tangible object can only occupy one place on the space-time continuum. Or in other words, at any given time, an object can only be in one place. And so uh, if I have a, uh, a valuable, uh, I have a, a bar of gold in front of me, and I look aside to see if I can get some more coffee, and the next thing that happens is I look back, the bar of gold isn't here, it's there. <laughs> you took it from me. It's perfectly obvious what happened. Mm -hmm. You must have. And so, because we can't both have that. If, if you have it, then I don't have it. And so, if money is material and you have some of it, then we need to redistribute it. It's called socialism because you must have taken it from me. And that's part of the idea of um, giving back to society because you were taking when you were making it. And they don't recognize the concept that my saxophone you might take, but you can't take my tune. Because if I whistle my tune and you like it, you walk out of here whistling, right. and you've got it, but I'm not any less off. So if money is spiritual, how does that connect to the overall question as to why Jews are more successful? Because of the following example I give. Let's say um, I want a pair of shoes, those sneakers with lights that flash in the hill when you walk. I've been wanting one of those for a long, a pair of that for a long time. I think we can arrange that. Uh, thank you. I, you seem to be able to arrange a lot of things. I'm very impressed. So uh, I'll just let you know some of my little wish list here. So I, uh, I go to a shoe store. And um, I go in, hey, you got any uh, shoes with uh, lights that flash in the hill? Oh, yeah, he says, sure. What size are you? I tell him, size 11. He says, okay. And he gets on his knees in front of me. Interesting. And he doesn't feel he's doing something menial because he's serving another human being. You know, there's, there's the chashiv of Sodom. I mean, mm -hmm. we are made in Akash Baruch Hu's image. And so whether consciously or subconscious, but in France, they don't have that. In America, they do, because it's part of America's old tradition mm -hmm. that man was made in the image of God. They believe that, many. And so I, I, uh, he, he puts the shoes on me. I, I, I'm delighted. They fit. They're beautiful. And boy, those lights flash when you walk. I like this. He puts it in a box for me. 
I put it under my arm and I give him twenty dollars. That's just for convenience sake. I know shoes cost more than that these days. I I don't want a twenty dollar pair when you when you do that. But um, let's just say twenty dollars. Okay. I walk out. Now we have to figure out um, what the financial statements look like. What does the profit and loss look like? What does the balance sheet look like? Okay. Fine. Well, he had bought that pair of shoes from the wholesaler, let's say the, the, I don't know exact the margin in the shoe industry, but let's say he bought it for $10. So it has an asset value on his books for $10. He's now lost the pair of shoes, but he's gained $20 in his till. He's happy. We, on our part, for my part, I'm walking down the road and I've got my pair of shoes. What's that worth to me? Well, we know it has to be worth at least $20, because otherwise, why would I have done that exchange? Nobody had a gun on me. I was, it was totally voluntary. And so I say, okay, I'm happy with my shoes. When you tap me on the shoulder and say, Rabbi Lappin, we want to do a little thought experiment here. We want to figure out what they really are worth. I say, okay, go ahead. What do you want to do? I want to buy them from you. Okay, what do you want to offer me? Twenty dollars. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> that just puts me back to where I was before. I got to go and find another shoe store that's got him. No. Okay, fine. I understand that you say I'll give you thirty dollars. Um, thirty ten dollar profit. You know what? I'm not. Okay. How about forty dollars? Now I'm kind of interested because Mrs. Lappin didn't raise a fool, mm -hmm. and a hundred percent profit in in just a few minutes. I, I, I'm not sure I can turn that down. You take my hesitation for uncertainty, and you up it, and you say, how about $45? I'll say, deal. I'll definitely sell it to you for 45 We have just established, according to the strictest of accounting rules, not gap rules, not generally accepted accounting principles, because they were set up by the Securities and Exchange Commission in order to standardize accountings of companies on the stock market. But in terms of evaluating what it's actually really worth, we've just proven it's worth 45 And so my financial statement went from 20 in my pocket to something that's valued at 45 So I benefited to the tune of $25. The shoe store owner benefited to the tune of $10. So in this little mini, this microcosm, this economic mini world, um, just because two human beings acted kindly towards one another and did a transaction helping one another, the end result is the creation of $35 worth of wealth. Mm -hmm. And it's not an accident that the place where that happened is called a chanut, a place of chen. What does chen mean? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, if um, you look up the Oxford English Dictionary for grace, it says this is the word the King James translation selected for the Hebrew word chen. And if you look up chen, they'll say grace. But it must be more than that, because when we say the benching, hazan et haolam kulo betuvo, Bechein bechesed over rachamim. Rachamim I get. Hashem feeds us with rachamim. I get a chesed for sure. What's the chain part of it? What does that mean? And it has to be that the clue is in Vayishlach, where Yaakov comes to Shechem, and there's a strange posuk that he arrives in Shechem, and the posuk ends with the words Vayichan et pnei ha'ir. Now, because an English translation has to be a lot quicker than I am, they just put in, he camped by the side of the city. But that's not what Vayichan et, because mm -hmm. et always implies that what comes is the object. It's something he did to the city. And the Gemara is a Gemara in Shabbos, which says uh, he uh, set up coinage, marketplace, mechatzos as well. But he introduced them in economy. That's what Chain is. It's one of the reasons that the holiday around Chen, which we call Chenuka, is a, is a holiday which has this weird preoccupation with money, in the sense that, that the Gemara says, uh, it's all Shabbos Chav uh, I think, um, where uh, Rabbi Yudha says, by the way, no benefit from the, the Chanukah candles. No benefit at all. 
And not even, now what do you think he might say? You know, we're Jews, we're the people of the book, we, uh, we're Talmud Torah, can I, Jews, I know you want to learn Torah, but not even for learning may you use the Shabbos candles, the Hanukkah candles. What it actually says is for counting your money. It's like perpetuating the worst Jewish stereotype. I mean, really? We can't wait for Hanukkah to be over so we can get back to counting our money? That's why that's the holiday. We only holiday we give children Hanukkah gelt, money, because mm-hmm. it's all about chen. And that's why the place where our benefit of chen is at our table, a shulchan, a shul chen. Mm. And if somebody is, uh, accepts charity, we call it metzap al shulchan chavero. He's sitting by to wait for what comes off the table. That's what we're talking about here. Chen is our ability to build an economic structure based on the spirituality of money. So, mm. yes, when, when we get all that and we understand that, by the way, in, in the marketing field, anybody who's in marketing, understands that the motivations that drive us to buy are very often Mm non-material. I'll I'll buy something that... uh, There's a woman I know very well whose name I will not reveal under any circumstances who will drive across town because her app shows that gas is cheaper. and, uh, And I try and explain, you know, it's your time and the gas you're wasting doesn't matter. She's from Western Long Island otherwise known as Brooklyn, mm-hmm. and, and she is definitely uh, going to buy the cheaper. That's a non-economic decision. Mm-hmm. It's a spiritual decision. It makes her happy to buy something for less expensive. A lot of buying is done like that because money is spiritual. So understanding that, people who get that are at a huge advantage. Wow. I love that. So we, we spoke about Dave Ramsey, and he, he has a, a wide audience. Many of them are... Jews and Orthodox Jews. Yes, actually, yes. Though, if you if you follow his advice, where he says that someone should live without any debt, um, use the cash system. Yeah, we're at a disadvantage because we have large families. We have private tuition. We have um, the cost of kosher food is more. There, the camps, things are more expensive yes, here. Yes, I should say. So what would Dave Ramsey say to the the Orthodox Jewish community that are trying to square that circle? So uh, let me say that there are a few uh, B'nai Torah guys, um, mostly in Baltimore, uh, a couple on the West Coast and a few on the East Coast, but a few guys who are B'nai Torah who actually do follow. It's not a big number at all. For the reasons exactly as you said, Ellie, it's it it's look. Um, there's uh, there's different kinds of debt. In the time and place where we are recording this show right now, we're looking at the reality of searing inflation. And so, uh, if somebody can now get hold of money at um, you know less than two percent. Go for it, provided it is not for a consumer purpose, but it's for a business purpose, and that you have a mode of repayment. You, you, there's a business plan there, mm-hmm. which is a spiritual document. And, you know, because, right, I mean, imagine, would somebody invest, if you said to them, hey, I, why don't you invest $100,000? I got this business. Really, what is it? Um, I got a warehouse. I got trucks. I got some machine tools. You'll love it. Okay, fine, but what's... No, that's it. That's a bit. We got trucks. We got a factory. We got machine tools. You got to come and see it. I mean, it's a big factory, twenty thousand square feet. Come and see it. I'm not investing, mm-hmm. but somebody can sketch out an idea over coffee on the back of a napkin, and I can't wait to invest because it's all spiritual, you know. And so, uh, uh, what what happens here as well is that um, uh, we understand. The, the spirituality of money. And we recognize that if we are going to borrow for a business purpose, and there's a mode of repayment, and if things go wrong, it's not going to be catastrophic, absolutely, now's not the time to hold cash, now's the time to hold debt, it's good. There's different times. So if you want to buy, borrow money to buy a new car, follow Dave Ramsey's rule. Go and pay cash for it. You'll really, it'll be better in every respect. But if you're borrowing in order to uh, 
buy real or whatever it is you you, you get that so uh, yeah so in those ways it it doesn't necessarily apply and um, and and let it be said that that I am personally familiar with huge numbers of people like thousands of people I've met at events whose lives have been saved by Dave Ramsey what is the overarching theme of the guidance he's got them out of debt how what what's what what is he doing to them or telling them to do that others have not drilled into their heads yeah so in many many cases nobody has drilled it into their heads at all um but uh again you know he's a coach and um he first of all reminds us that when you pay with cash it hurts when you swipe a credit card, it doesn't hurt. So he tries to get you to do as much as you you can do by cash. Again, uh, with a, a functioning a Torah household, with, with it's not, it's not always practical. Mm-hmm. Although we certainly always um, gave our children their money in cash, and we had them immediately take off the tzedakah and immediately take off the part for investment. So there are definitely important ways in which to use cash. But that would be one thing Dave does. Another thing he does is uh, focus on cutting back non-essentials. He says, listen, for as long as it takes, live on beans and rice. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he doesn't have Shabbos. I'm sorry, you know, I want my chant no matter what. Fine, we have to make allowances. Which for for some people is beans and rice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> you're right <laughs> so um so that's what he does and then he encourages you and he he also shows you how to which which debts to tackle first and then it starts feeding on itself because the sipuka nefesh that flows from actually getting closer to the point where you don't owe anybody anything there's such a sense of joy and freedom and and i mean there's so many psukim in tanakh that allude to this idea ish uh, eved ish love le, le malve, the borrower is a slave to the lender i mean we know all that right. but we've become accustomed to accepting the condition of debt and and again that's why i say i i I, I thank our Kodesh Baruch every day for my work in helping people uh, increase their revenue. Um, so I don't focus so much. I mean, I, I refer a lot of people to Dave, but I'm focused more on the revenue side than on the debt side. You've got to get rid of the debt, no question about it, but it's a whole lot easier if you can dramatically increase your revenue. We're living in a time where there's a bit of a teacher shortage. There's a demand for teachers they're not paid perhaps what they're worth. I heard a beautiful story that you shared um, related to teachers and paying them what they're worth. Can you share that with the audience? Um, I'm not sure exactly which one you mean, but let me try. Was was this somebody called my radio show? I think so. Yeah. Anyway, if if it's not the one you mean, stop me. But um, this is... um, I was I was speaking about how the market works. It's it's under my general rubric that the Torah teaches us how the world, and I stress the word, really works. And and so uh, uh, this uh, this individual called, and she was explaining how uh, she's um, she's not paid what she's worth. And what do you do? You're a teacher. You're not paid what you're worth. And I said, well. Uh, what would you like? She said, I, I need your advice. I need to know how to solve this problem. I said, easy. Got pe- pen and paper handy? She says, yeah. I said, all right, here, here's what you need to write down. Write down a Q and then a U and then an I and then a T. She said, what do you mean? I said, quit. You're not being paid what you're worth. Where's your self-respect? Out the door. Now, I was trying to make a point. In, in reality, there's a whole different category of discussion on how to negotiate raises. That's a different thing. But here I was making a point. She said, she said, well, what am I going to do? I said, it's easy. Since you're underpaid, there obviously are people willing to pay you more, and that's how you know you're underpaid. Long silence, long silence. And on radio, silences go forever. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, I don't know if there's anybody willing to pay me more. I said, well, let your ears hear what your mouth says, as the Gomorrah says. Um, you've just told me that you're not under, you're not over, uh, underpaid, pardon me. How can you be? Because you don't know anybody who's going to pay you more. If you did think you were really underpaid, you'd quit. The fact that you don't means you're not. You're not being paid what you like. But guess what? Join the club. That's true for most of us. 
We'd all like to be paid more than we are. Doesn't mean we're underpaid. And I, I, I try to give her a little bit of a primer on, on how the market works. The fact is that um, a lot of people want to be teachers. There's a lot of benefits. And union bargaining um, makes it even better. There are very, very few teachers who could make on the open market what they make as teachers. And God bless them. I, mean, I, I appreciate teachers and the, many of them who, who engage in considerable Messiris Nefesh to teach. I get that. But, uh, but the idea that they're underpaid, according to what rule? If you want to set up a committee to determine the wages of every occupation, you'll destroy an economy very quickly on that basis because it all depends on free transactions between free human beings. So what's going to happen there is, though, teachers that would be great for the next generation will chase a salary elsewhere and society as a whole is going to lose out on prime education. We're going to have subpar teachers that may not fit the roles that we're given them because we've had teachers chasing other industries, other jobs, and we as a whole are losing out as a result. So this is uh, obviously uh, true in our community, Masha and Kane in the world at large, where uh, teachers, for the most part, feel pretty well taken care of. Um, but in our community, it is true. It's, it, it is a huge problem. And it's not a new problem because uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw penned the old aphorism that those who can do and those who can't teach. It's cruel and false. Um, but like, like most things that last, there's at least an element of truth to it. There's an, an awareness that um, there is a bigger availability of supply than the demand. Um, Just by the nature of things, uh, our yeshivas are turning out uh, more people than for whom jobs in communal work exists. And that that means the supply of people willing to do that work is at a certain uh, certain level. It is a problem. There's there's no question about it. And the only the only redeeming feature is that uh, many of these rabbis are incredibly dedicated, and they're people for whom uh, teaching um, is a huge privilege. And again, by the way. Um, in the Hasidic communities, I've noticed that even the first grade Rebbe is like a, a rock star. He's, he's highly, uh, in the communities, held very, very high. Sure. We had a guest on one of our shows, and it generated a lot of feedback. And the clip, he says, you can't ask too much of a job. You're, always, you're not always going to like what you do. You're not always going to be able to have a job that provides a lot of good mm-hmm. for people, mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to live with an imperfect job and do some of the other things on your wish list on your own time. Meaning, everyone's chasing meaning from their yes. job. Yes. And he said, you can ask too much from it. It's mm-hmm. not going to check off all the boxes on your wish list of what you want um, from your life. And you have to find, if, you, if you're looking for good, you know, maybe you volunteer. If you're looking for friendships, maybe it's not going to take place in, in the workplace. Um, Let's explore that for a little bit. When people come to you for advice um, related to their job, they have a job, mm-hmm. but they're just not content or happy with it. They're not yes. like you are running right. running to work on a Sunday morning. Yeah. What do you tell them to realign their focus? Um, okay, so yeah, this, this goes back a little bit to, again, to our understanding of money. Um, one of the worst pieces of advice that I ever hear is the advice given to people, uh, usually at graduation ceremonies of colleges and, and universities or commencement exercises. And um, I've heard this time and time again, which is, um, uh, you know, you must find work. Now that you've finished your education, you must find a job doing something that you love. And that way, oh, you'll never work a day in your life. Okay. You know, I'll ask you, Ellie, and I feel that your answer to this question will be exactly like mine. 
which somebody applies to you for a job in one of your companies, shall we say, and you say to them, so where do you see yourself in five years? Oh, my passion is music. And in five years time, I'm hoping to have made enough money that I've saved in order to be able to start my own band. And, uh, and I'm hoping to be able to cut records. So in five years time, I see myself as a musician. Uh, I know what I'd say, which is, don't call us, we'll call you, maybe. Right. You know, right. I'm sorry. I what some, I, I, ideally, what I want to hear is five years' time, well, I think I, I see myself sitting in your chair mm -hmm. and uh, doing the stuff you do so as you can move on and uh, do more important stuff that you can only do. I want to make your life easier and better and more prosperous in every possible way. That's what I'm here to do. I hear that. I snap you up. Before I even know where you, I'm going to put you in my company, I, I want you. Um, this is what graduates are being told at college, the other way around. Oh, you must look for what you love doing. Now, I love going boating with my family every summer off the coast of Canada. That's what I love doing. Ellie, I've got to tell you, in spite of the attempts that, that span many years, mm -hmm. I've yet to find anybody to pay me to do what I love doing. Doesn't pay the bills. Nobody wants to pay me to do that. Right. They've got it all back to front. The reality is that we have to find out where we can most serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu's other children and then learn to love doing that. Because there is joy in making money. Because if you understand what money is, it is nothing other. Forget everything in Econ 101, you know, means of exchange, blah, 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 blah. No, money is a spiritual thing. It is evidence that you have pleased another one of Hashem's children. That's what it is. Money, if you've got a dollar in your pocket and you didn't defraud anybody and you didn't hold up a convenience store to get it and you didn't mug a little old lady and take her pocketbook, then the only way you got that dollar is you pleased another person. I don't know if it was a customer or a client or your boss or a relative, but somebody put it in your pocket voluntarily. Mm -hmm. You didn't force them because whatever it was you did for them was worth more. And that's an important thing to understand. And so we, we get that as well, that uh, money is, is a spiritual thing and um, and our 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 desire is to serve and, and it's it's evidence of that and so find out how you can serve other people best way you can serve other people and maybe it means that you have to acquire skills that you don't have because to come out of yeshiva or out of kolo and to assume that because of your intellectual background, uh, you're able to step. It, it's not so, because you are competing with many, many, many other people who are also naturally bright. And but you, you, you don't. In order to find out how you can best serve other people, there's only one simple question: How can I serve the most people the best way? And in this sense. Um, to to move into the to, to to the world of general culture, who has done more for most of Hashem's children, Bill Gates or the late Mother Teresa of Calcutta? It's not it's not even a Shiloh, right? A, a, more than a billion people use Windows software, and they nobody forced them. They could have gone to uh, Linux or Apple. They bought Microsoft. Mother Teresa, with the best will in the world, she made life a little easier for how many people? A hundred thousand at most. A million? Come on, you're, you're stretching. Mm -hmm. But not a billion. And so doing the most good for Hashem's other children is what makes the money flow. It's got nothing to do with what you enjoy doing. Now, there are certain people who have certain talents in certain directions. If I found out that, um, uh, that, that I could make money by... Um, leading the, the dancers at a chasada, uh, it, I just don't have talent in that area. So that wouldn't be a very good idea. Mm -hmm. For somebody who is very good at music uh, to, be, to be told, you know, you should go along and, and become an Amazon delivery driver, that also doesn't make sense. There is a way of entrepreneurially uh, monetizing 
what you're innately good at. But many, many, many of us do not have any specific talents in any specific areas. And so we have to learn. Entrepreneurialism is, uh, is, is a learned skill. It's not something you're born with any more than, you know, we're, we're born with knowing how to make a good omelet. It doesn't work that way. Right. You've come across, I would imagine, quite a few wealthy people. And there are happy wealthy people and there are miserable wealthy sure. people. Do you, what common theme do you see in the happier wealthy people? Assuming the adage of happiness uh, does not come from wealth. Do you see this, this theme of giving back and those who are living not for themselves? Is, the, is, that, is that it wow. in a nutshell? Oh, my goodness. You're opening up so many crucially important things here. So first of all, money doesn't come from – excuse me, happiness doesn't come from – having money and one of the best proofs of that are people who win the lottery mm -hmm. it's impossible to find any almost impossible to find people who are happier after than before their lives usually unravel mm -hmm. so winning money or getting money does not bring happiness interestingly enough earning money does so when you've created it there is something important that comes out of that there is a satisfaction because we remember that money is evidence that you've served other human beings, that you've displayed chesed. So an afgamina, a difference there would be generational wealth. Someone who is in a will and receives that money, that's not necessarily earned. can be very problematic, and that's one of the reasons that how often it is you find trust fund babies not doing very much with their lives. Uh -huh and not being happy. Another part of it is, I mean, you know, by us, Simcha is a mitzvah. Now, you think to yourself, that's a little hard to understand. I mean, if, if, my, if my commanding officer says jump, then I jump and I ask how high on the way up. But if, I, uh, if somebody says happy, whoa. But this is exactly what happened to me. I was 15. And I must have been slouching around the house on Ben Asmanim, and uh, my mom was getting a bit tired. Now, my mother came from a pretty tough school of education, mm -hmm. and, um, and she got very annoyed at me whining around the house, being miserable and projecting my misery on everyone else around. I must have been horrible. And uh, she said, stop that. I want you to be happy. And I said, oh, you want me to be happy? Get me a motorcycle. Uh-oh. Whap! For the rest of the day, I walk around with four finger marks on my cheek. Mm -hmm. And she said, Daniel, your happiness isn't my obligation. It's yours. Vahaita ach sameach. You've got to be happy. That was the first time I was ever introduced to this idea that happiness is a moral obligation. And when I'm, I'm involved in, in Shiduchim, it's a hugely important, if you are not ready, if you haven't mastered being happy under all circumstances, I'm not saying you have to be content, right? It means you've got to have a chalik. It doesn't, be, it doesn't say, it doesn't mean you have to be happy with whatever you got. No, there is such a thing as uh, wanting your chalik and deciding what your chalik is. But um, uh, the, the idea that as a uh, husband or a wife, you can allow your foul mood to pollute the household. Mm -hmm. Chutzpah, who, where do you get such an idea from? Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to do that. So the Indian of being happy is a hugely important one, and it has nothing to do with the money. However, if you are making money, there's a big core of happiness already right there because you are serving. You, to, you know, people, better to give than to receive, right? I mean, to, to be a, a dispenser of chesed, who wouldn't rather be a gavir who, who is able to dispense uh, help to people? It's a wonderful thing, and, and they enjoy it. It's lovely. And so um, uh, the idea that, um, that money is, is evidence of moral censure and and it, it indicates that somehow you're less of a of a ben Torah than you could this is a very very dangerous and destructive thinking so that so that's why I, making money is 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 hugely enjoyable so i say to the guy who's got this job now let's rethink totally 
it's possible you may be able to make more money. That, that is a sign that you'd be pleasing more people. If so, let's talk about that. But if you're stuck here for a variety of different reasons, at least for a certain period of time, let's talk about being happy where you are. And let's see the joy in serving other people. Obviously, you're helping somebody. Otherwise, you wouldn't be getting paid. And it's a change of attitude rather than a change of job. You have a book, Thou Shall Prosper. We'd like to ask our guests, what books that you did not write would you recommend uh, the oh, reading audience? Um, um, that, that's a very, that's a very, very good question. Um, and I, I can't list the Torah. You, you could. I, I, can someone find that on Amazon? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's one of the top sellers I hear. I, 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 I haven't checked the figures. I, I just <laughs> checked my books, but uh, <laughs> uh, but um, um, there's a guy. He's a um, uh, his Hasidish guy lives in Monsey. Many years ago, he wrote a book called "The Road Back," and it was the it was one of the very very first books uh, that launched the Balshuva movement back in the eighties. So so that that's that's a terrific book. Um, uh, there's a diary of a medieval German woman, uh, from woman, the wife of a merchant. She became the widow. Uh, the book is called Glickel of Hamelin. Glickel was her name. It's it's it's, it's worth it's worth seeing and, and understanding. And um, I'm also a big believer in spending a certain amount of time every week reading aloud, in English. Mm. Uh, because when your own ears hear the words that your own lips and mouth articulate, uh, it develops your ability to effectively communicate, which is hugely important for making money, obviously. Right? The most, most important organ is our mouths in business. So in the, on that note, would you recommend people picking up the phone and making a phone call versus sending an email? Um, so, so yes. I mean, there's a reason that Avram Avinu used to feed people that came to his house. He used to feed them before he spoke to them. It's exactly the same reason that business professionals fight over the check after a meal. Uh -huh. Because when someone eats your food, they are more open to your thinking. Uh-huh. So next meeting, and I so should bring a sushi The best platter. thing is, um, is to meet in person if... Uh, that's by far and away the best thing. Uh, after that, a, a Zoom call. After that, a phone call. Email down the bottom of the list. Wow. It's, uh, it's not an ideal way to, to build business relationships. Wow. If you can leave the audience with a closing remark, a thought, something that either keeps you up at night, something that helps you sleep better at night. Um, we have, I think, now over 10,000 listeners. With good well, reason. I've, I've heard many of the shows. They're absolutely delightful. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have a great team here. What would you like to leave them with? I think that... Um, I think it's to, to understand that uh, in Perek Bays of Bereshis, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Lo tov heyot adam levado. It's not good for a man to be alone. Um, I'd like people to think about how relevant that is to far beyond Ottomarishan's matrimonial prospects. This isn't just a localized statement. This is a general statement in all places and in all times that for us to be isolated isn't good. And that essentially HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us two ways of making this world a less lonely place. One of them is by family relationships, and the other is with money. And this is why it is that the middle section of Shisha Sidre Mishnah is Nashim and Nazikin. Sexual relationships, if you will, which produce family, and... Um, financial relationships. These are, are fundamental. Essentially, our Kodesh Baruch Hu incentivizes us to obey his wishes. He doesn't want us to be alone and isolated. So he gives us the joys of family life. That's one way we should connect. And he gives us the joys of making money, which is the other way to connect. 
and that law tove yotan adam lavado not good for us to be alone is hugely important and and what we do is we we have to realize that there's a reason that when you drive through jewish neighborhoods very seldom do you see uh, you know drive through a jewish neighborhood on a sunday how often do you see a yid under his car with his uh, half his body out you see his tzitzis there and he's busy fixing his car we don't do that so much because we understand that a Kodesh Baruch Hu built a world of specialization, right? That's the uh, uh, the beautiful Gemara of Ben Zoma. It's a, it's a fantastic Gemara where he um, he was standing on the steps of the Beis Hamidrash and the crowds of people going by him. It's it's in Brocha stuff Nun Nun Dalit, I want to say. Um, he uh, and he he says this is incredible. All these people. The only reason our Kodesh Baruch who built them and created them is L'sham Shani. They should serve me. He says, Adam Arishan had to do everything himself. He had to grind flour. He had to, it was a rough life. He says, me. There's somebody who delivers milk to my house. There's somebody baking bread for me. Everything I need. All these people are here serving me. That's Bore Nefashos Rabos V'chesronan. We eat and we thank God for creating many, many people. That's why money is made better in cities than in isolated urban rural areas we need lots of people but we need them to have needs thank you Hashem for creating so many people with needs because that gives me an opportunity to fill those needs and that way that I get to eat too and so we 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 must learn to connect with other people so you know it's one of the things I say if a, if a guy has been learning wants to now start making money uh, to now start becoming a doctor or, or even a lawyer, not so simple. But Hashem has a field called business, where you just focus on serving other people their needs, as Ben Zoma said. And all that means is you have to specialize, find a narrow area. You can't do it yourself, no problem. Find a partner, law tov. Don't be do this alone. Find a shutter. You know, maybe maybe you can find somebody who's exactly you, but in the opposite. He's a guy who loves being the workshop making widgets. Mm-hmm. He hasn't the faintest idea of how to how to sell them. He has no idea how to mark. You learn how to do that, and you make you create a business. I'm just saying. I mean, there's there's a hundred different things uh, mm-hmm. that we could talk about in this context. But you asked me to leave one thought, and that is, don't be alone. I love it, Rabbi Daniel, Daniel. Lappin, thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. It's a pleasure being with you, and, and I'm, I'm honored. You've got a, such a, a great lineup. I've seen some, some really, really neat shows. So um, I hope this will take its place among them. Amen. Thank you. The Kosher Money Podcast is hosted by Eli Langer, run by Zevi Woolman, Eli Langer, and myself, Yaakov Langer, and it is produced by Living L'Chaim. For more awesome podcasts and shows, check out livinglechaim.com. Check us up on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Living Lechaim.